weeks ago, um, I was asked to do a, a wedding for a uh, young lady that lived with us for a period of time, and she wanted a small private wedding, turned out to be a small private 50 person wedding, but I was picturing a much smaller event. We didn't have a rehearsal because I was teaching and the family didn't come in. So it was semi-informal and I was getting ready to do the wedding ceremony and ordinarily the mother of the bride sits down and everyone sits. Well, the mother didn't and I didn't ask anyone to sit down and so I was looking at my wife and she was going, So if you see me looking over there, I, you know that she's encouraged me to do something I'm not doing like a minute ago. <laughs> she looked at me and, and smiled real big, and I knew what that meant. Uh, we've been married for 34 years. I know that when she smiles at me, she says, you got your mean teacher face on, fix it. So uh, I'm trying to get rid of my teacher face, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that you asked everyone to sit down or you would be standing still. Um, I was a little concerned when I wrote this sermon because there's very few scriptures that are very few verses in the scriptures that I want to look at, but we're going to look at Luke 8, 22 through 25, and I'm going to start my soccer watch, and if the 15-minute quarter has passed, then I know I've done okay. If I still have 12 minutes left, then I know I probably went too fast. So I'll be watching my I watch, but probably not for the same reason you would be watching yours. Um, while studying the Eastern Sierras, uh, my wife and I got the opportunity to study Mono Lake. And I don't know if you are familiar with Mono Lake, but it's the big lake that you see right before you go up. I believe it's called Conway Summit. As you're leaving the area where, where uh, Lee Vining is, and you're going up to Bridgeport. Mono Lake is a high elevation saltwater lake because there is no outlet. There's only streams that flow in. So the only way that the water gets out of Mono Lake is by evaporation, which leaves all of the salt and the other minerals that are brought down from the mountains in the lake. So it's a peculiar, peculiar lake to California. There are no fish, although you can fish in the streams. There are some organisms that live there that the salt doesn't affect them. One of them are little brine shrimp. So if you have a saltwater aquarium and you feed shrimp, live shrimp, to your fish, most likely they came from Mono Lake. And also, there are black flies. And when I read about them, I couldn't picture them. I read that the, the shoreline of the lake was covered with these black flies. And until I went there and got close enough to see when they talk about the shoreline being covered, there at the right time of year is about a foot and a half of flies sitting on the water, just doing whatever they do. But one of the things that those those fish, I mean those flies do is they lay their larvae in the water. So as we were studying, one of the interesting facts that really has nothing to do with our sermon. Um, was that the, the indigenous people would collect the flar fly larvae, dry them out, and then use them for protein. And one of the first pioneer settlers from Europe that came into the area noted in his journal that the indigenous people fed him a rice-like dish that was delicious. <laughs> and later to find out that they were the fly larvae. But the, the shrimp is also a very important part in our ecosystem. It is the main food of the seagulls who fly over the Sierra Nevada mountain range and mate and nest and raise their young on an island on Mono Lake before returning back over the mountains to the Pacific. And it was on one of these two major islands that people would go and collect the seagull eggs, and then they would sell them to the mining town of Bodie. 
they would also take picnics out to the lake. So they would get in their boats and they would go out to the lake. But they had to be very careful because in the afternoons, the winds would come up. And if you've lived in the desert, you know the afternoon winds come up. At this high elevation at Mono Lake, when the winds come up, they come up. And many people drown in the lake or, or faced uh, uh, a treacherous journey back. Um, on May 1st, or May 31st, 1898, six men drowned when the wind capsized a boat that the owner thought was unsinkable. And it was this story, as I was reading, and other tales of the drownings and the near drownings on Mono Lake, that reminded me the story that we're about to read of Jesus and his disciples. I've never been to the Sea of Galilee, but I've lived in the desert for 28 years now. And that's long enough to know that the wind almost always blows in the afternoons and the evenings. Andrew, Peter, James, and John knew this as well. They understood more than most how perilous the sea can be when the wind begins to blow. They grew up on this lake. They made their living on this lake before they began to follow Jesus. It was from the shore of this lake that Jesus called them to be his disciples. They were fishermen, and this was their lake. And then, verse 22, one day, Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into the boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided and all was calm. Where is your faith? He asked the disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. Today I want to examine these two questions that were asked. First, where is your faith? And who is this? Andrew, Peter, James, and John probably heard the wind, or at least saw the effects of the wind, before it reached the boat. So, the Sea of Galilee is a, a large lake, so you would be able to see a long ways off on the flat surface of the lake. One day I was sitting at Kennedy Lake in the Sierra Nevada Mountains fishing while keeping my eye on the thunderheads that form every summer afternoon as the cooler coastal air meets the hotter desert air in, uh, over the mountains. On this particular afternoon, we heard the wind blowing in the trees. We saw the surface of the water at the far end of the lake begin to react. And before we could get our lines out of the water, we were being pelted with hail and rain. We ran for shelter to the closest trees, but we were soaked before we got to them. I am certain that the fishermen saw what was coming and were giving to orders to the others in the boat in an attempt to prepare for the storm. I can picture the sail coming down, their belongings being secured, tucked under things, the buckets for bailing out the boats being located. I'm curious of who took the rudder. I think it was Peter, because I always picture him as a strong, take charge kind of guy. I doubt that it was the tax collector with a boat full of fishermen. That doesn't mean, if you work for the IRS, that you can't be a strong, take charge kind of guy. But I think in this circumstance, it was probably one of the fishermen at the rudder. Although the storm was raging, I don't think the boat was immediately in danger of sinking. Although, or I believe that there was a battle going on between the men and the elements. I think that several minutes went by and that the disciples were exhausted and at the point of defeat when they finally turned to Jesus and cried out, Master, Master, we're going to drown. Why do I think that? Because we do the same thing. 
When the storms of life hit us, we attempt to solve the problem by ourselves first. Especially if we perceive the problem as something that we have experience in or something that we might be experts at. Too often, we're like the fishermen thinking that we can handle these, this by ourselves. We don't need anyone's help, and the last thing we're going to do is to ask for help. We do it when we're at work and the problem arises. We do it with our family relationships. We do it with our financial difficulties. Why do we allow ourselves to look at our own abilities first? How do you think the story would be different if the boat was full of small children? How long do you think they would have allowed Jesus to sleep? He probably wouldn't have been napping at all with small children in the boat. They would not have attempted to, to wake him after they had tried everything they knew. They would have awoken him at the first sign of trouble. Where is your faith? Is it in yourself? The, if there are any non-believers in the room, that's all that a non-believer has. But as Christians, we have so much more. The disciples also had faith in each other. If anyone can survive this storm, four expert fishermen and nine other men in their prime are the team to bet on. Often, it's our friends that we turn to in times of crisis. Many times, however, the best that our friends can do is support us in our situation but they're powerless to fix our problems. Sometimes we turn to our brothers and sisters in faith or to a minister to help solve our problems. And when our problems can't be solved by them, we lose our faith in the church or in the minister. Where is your faith? In your friends? In your minister? In your counselor? Finally, at the point of despair, the disciples turned to Jesus. Non-believers, you don't have to wait until you come to the point where you feel that your life is hopeless and you're full of despair before you turn to Jesus. He's here for you now. Believers, when we try to solve our problems ourselves or turn to our friends for help before seeking Jesus' help, we're no different than the non-believers. Where is your faith? When I was young, I thought that this story was about Jesus' power to overcome the wind and the sea. And I thought that somehow Jesus was testing the disciples to see how much faith they had. This story is not about having enough faith. It's about the priorities of your faith. Jesus should be the first person that we bring our problems to, not the last. It's not that there's anything wrong with trying to take care of our problems out using our own strength or turning to our friends for help. In fact, I think we need to do those things. The story is about who is first in your life. Jesus wants to be the first one that you turn to in times of trouble. He should be the first one that we turn to in order to give thanks. He should be the first person we think of when we need advice. Our faith should be in Him first. The second question is more important than what is in your wallet. It is, who is in your boat? When Jesus rebuked the storm and it subsided, His disciples asked, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey Him. They came to a new understanding of who Jesus is. As a non-believer, you might want to attempt to sail through life on your own. You don't have to. Jesus, the man who can calm all storms, desires to ride along with you. For the believers in the audience, I want to remind us that we have the one who is from the beginning in our boat. Seek him first. We have the one who was at creation in our boat. Seek Him first. We have the one who was raised from the dead in our boat. Seek Him first. We have the one to whom 
All authority in heaven on earth was given. Seek him first. My concern is like the disciples, that we may not have a complete understanding of who Jesus is. We may never have a complete understanding until we're in heaven. But we certainly should have the best understanding possible. How can we come to know Jesus better? Perhaps by reading about what he did and what he said. Perhaps by spending time in prayer. Perhaps by listening and sharing how he's worked in our lives and in the lives of our friends. Why is this important? Not because we won't be saved if we don't, but because we need to reflect the truest form of Jesus that we can. Our view of Jesus, in my opinion, is the mirror that we use to reflect the image to the people, his image to the people around us. If our mirror is straight and true, the reflection will represent who Jesus truly is. But if our mirror is cloudy or dusty, people will have a hard time seeing Jesus live in us. If our mirror is warped like a funhouse mirror, then we'll not be reflecting the true Jesus, but a distorted one. If we believe that Jesus is more concerned about keeping rules than he is about people, then we are going to reflect that in the way that we talk to others. If we believe that Jesus is only about love and not holy living, then we might reflect to the people around us a Jesus who we only preach is important for us to believe in him, but how we live has nothing to do with what we believe. If we teach that Jesus is bound by the words in the New our interpretation of the words in the New Testament, then the Jesus we're reflecting is not the Jesus whom God gave all authority on heaven and earth. He's the Jesus that's bound by our interpretation of his words. We need to be a people who desire to reflect the true Jesus. Was he loving and compassionate? We need to be loving and compassionate. Did he care for the sick, feed the hungry, clothe the naked? Then we need to do the same. Did he speak out against the oppression of the weak and the poor? Can we remain silent? Did he honor the institution of marriage and the family? How can we not? Did he teach us to live holy lives, honoring God and each other? We should not desire to live as he taught us to live, out of fear, but rather so that we can be better reflections of who Jesus truly is. Who is this Jesus that the wind and the waves obey him? What is his desire for our life? How does he want me to act? May we never stop trying to answer these questions. May our desire truly be to reflect Jesus's, to reflect Jesus, let me start over. May our desire to truly reflect Jesus grow stronger every day. May others see in us a clear reflection of Jesus and have a desire to have a relationship with him. If you've come to believe that you need Jesus in your boat, or if you don't know who Jesus is, but desire to learn more about him, please come forward to meet with one of our elders. If you're experiencing a storm and want to acknowledge that you want to seek Jesus' help, please come forward and we'll call on him.